We, did, we do tape them, and they're on our website uh, at PainesvilleCE.com. So if you really enjoyed today and you wanted to share it with someone, uh, you could give them that website. It's a community ed website, and they'll have this whole presentation. So uh, we're glad that you came. We do have brochures in the back with uh, Pink Sheet 2 with some other upcoming events that you might be interested through community ed. We have our talent showcase on April 14th. That's our benefit for the auditorium and uh, equipment and program fund. Uh, fun, so that's a community talent show. Um, you might enjoy that. And there's other activities there too. Um, but I'd really like to welcome Tom Thielen. Uh, Tom has some very extensive um, uh, travel experience on the Amtrak. In fact, he just came back from a 30 day tour on and off on the Amtrak. And uh, he's going to share today with us uh, his experiences the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think, right? And um, we're just glad that you came, and let's welcome Tom Thielen. Well, I can use the mic. I can use the mic or not use it. Let's see this. Hold it closer to your mouth. What happened? Yep, it's one you got to really kind of talk into. Okay. Nope. Okay. Closer. Maybe, maybe I don't need it. Is it better if I do use it? Huh? No. Okay. You can hear well? Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to just shut that down for the time being. And we'll, uh, we'll have a, a period of discussion. I will go through uh, uh, my experiences and most recent experiences and uh, tell you a little bit about the, some of the places where I have traveled and uh, uh, maybe some preferences of mine and uh, well, all kinds of uh, things about train travel. So to start, though, I'm going to ask each of you just to uh, give us your name and uh, what city you're currently from and where you grew up, because that will give us a little bit of an idea of what kinds of trains you might have traveled on when you were youngsters, you know. And I didn't expect we'd have a lot of kindergarten kids here today. I figured it'd kind of be an audience... Uh, that uh, didn't have a whole lot of obligation and maybe interested in train travel. So uh, that's real good. Let's start right here. R.E.H. Uh, stands for? <laughs> we're, uh, we're Bob and Della Cromwick, and we recently moved here from uh, North Dakota. Prior to that, we lived and we were both raised in Montana. Both raised in Montana? Yeah. Wonderful. What area in Montana? Uh, Powder River County, down the southeast. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So you want to just introduce yourself, your yeah. first name? I'm Della. 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 Okay. Um, you grew up in Montana too, did you? Right. Okay. I remember taking the train from Bozeman to Seattle. And Those were the old City days, right? <laughs> now it's a little hard getting right. from Bozeman. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, welcome. Let's, uh, Jeannie, you want to uh, tell everybody uh, who you are and where you grew up and Maybe you, did you have any train travel in your childhood? I am Jeannie Rodo and I grew up in um, Hector, Minnesota. And we took the train to um, Washington, D.C. and New York for our class trip. That's the only experience I've had. Great. We'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> tell us where you grew up and then we'll uh, be able to tell if you have any train travel in your <laughs> past. I'm Gloria Elliott. I grew up in Hawker, Nevada. I moved to Minnesota when I was 19. And then we moved to Painesville in 1994. Okay. Did you travel a little bit on train, did you, when you were young? When I was very young. I don't remember much of it. Okay. Well, we hope when you leave today you'll, uh, you'll itch to go on a, a train ride. You want to give us your name and where you grew up? Now? I am Sharon Fry. I am her sister. Okay. And I was born and raised in Hawthorne, Nevada. Mm -hmm. And I've taken Amtrak from uh, Sacramento, California to Reno, Nevada. Okay. And I've also taken it. I bet you hit the casinos, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I took Amtrak from Minneapolis, Minnesota to San Diego. Mm -hmm. 
So I was on it for four days. Mm -hmm. So, good. yeah, I like Amtrak. Good, good. Well, you maybe can help me. When I get stuck here, you can help me a little bit. Okay, <laughs> okay let's uh, get you folks to it. My name is Sally Becker. We live in, uh, in London now, but I grew up and lived most of our life in uh, Worthington. Okay. And the only times I've been on a train, well, the first time I, my sister and I took a trip to New Hampshire. And At what was, age? Oh, that was about five years ago, five, six years oh, ago. Oh, okay, so yeah, pretty other recent. Other than that, I'd never been on a train. Oh, okay, okay. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit, too, after a while. Thank you. Hi. I'm Mark Packer. Uh, I live in Worthington. I married her, but when I was a little kid, I lived in Albert Lee near the train tracks. Oh boy, and, lots of trains uh, in Albert Lee, weren't there? But the older kids scared the devil out of us. Hmm. And so until I was fairly old, I was scared of trains because they'd say the bums are going to get you and all that oh, kind of stuff. Boy, you know? yeah. <laughs> but after she took her trip uh, three years ago, she talked me into going to uh, North Carolina. So we uh, we took the coach for a quite a long trip, mm -hmm. and we're ready now to move again. Okay, wonderful. Great. Pat? Pat Bogley um, grew up right around here, so we never had trains as a child. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we did the Copper Canyon this Excursion winter. Excursion train? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we've done Silverton to Durango or Durango to Silverton. Okay. Never been on a train. <laughs> Grew the up bums, here. The bums here. won't get you. <laughs> <laughs> the bums won't get you. Sharon House. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Lorraine Raffling. Um, we moved to Painesville in 1995. Grew up by Belgrade, so didn't move too far away. And I've never been on a train. So. Oh boy, you've got a. High five. <laughs> you got something to look forward to. Wonderful. Well, you can introduce Staples. yourself too. Give him the mic. He can tell us who he is. I don't think. Yeah. I'm, I'm Ken Staples. I grew up up in what they call Manhattan Beach, Minnesota. Okay. We didn't have tracks even close to us. Mm -hmm. The only train I rode one night when I was younger, I hopped on the couplings between two boxcars and drove from Pine River to Brainerd. And that was <laughs> 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 Did you stop anywhere along the line to sharpen oh, any boy. butcher knives or anything? <laughs> well, when we got into Merrifield, they slowed down a little bit, and we thought about hopping off there. And, the train uh, went through Merrifield, huh? Yeah, we came down 371 to okay, Peak Lot, sure. and cut across yeah. the Merrifield, and then, uh, but we still had the couplings all the way. Wow. <laughs> Wouldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lynn Staples, and I grew up here and lived in St. Cloud for 25 years, and now I'm back. So, and I've never had anything to do with trains. Never been on the train. No. Wonderful. Let's uh, let's change that. I'm Patsy Fenske, and came from Morgan, Minnesota. There was a lot of train traffic down there because of the grain and stuff, you know. And uh, when I was a child, my dad took my mom and my brother and I to Wilmer. And we took the train up to Grafton, North Dakota, to visit my uncle and aunt. And I have been totally fascinated with trains ever since, so I'm excited to learn some more. Good. Well, glad. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alice Fansky grew up in Morgan, Minnesota. Uh, never been on a train in this country. We were one time in Switzerland, we've been on a train, but never in this country. So we want to go out west and learn something, so we came to the experts. So. Super. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Jan Fuchs. I have not ridden a train as well. I grew up in the area. It's painful. Hi, Mary Ellen Morris. I grew up in the Lee Sewer Bell Plain, New Prague, Henderson area. I went in high school to Chicago and to Denver on the train. I love trains. How long ago uh, was it? <laughs> in the 60s, travel? early 60s. Early 60s, oh my, okay. I'm Patty Bayer. I grew up in Melrose. I was on a train trip from uh, Melrose to Florida. It was, took about a three-day trip, and that was in the 60s. People in the, uh, I think the airlines were on strike at that time. So that was a long trip, long trip. And then after we moved to, uh, we got married, moved to Regal, and then we were right next to the railroad tracks. So we had uh, railroad tracks. Did the train uh, whistles ever bother you? <laughs> Not us, but the grandchildren. When they, they'd stay overnight, and they would wake up in the middle of the night crying because it was real loud there. Really loud, because they'd always have to honk their horn for the crossing, right down the at the end of the block. So, but uh, it took a while to get used to. 
And especially in the summer, if you opened your windows. When those grandchildren were there a couple of days, did they start getting used to it also? Uh, they probably weren't there too many days in a row. Maybe like two, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure on that either. Okay. So right. that was interesting. Okay. Larry Danielson. I uh, grew up west of New London, graduated in New London. I, went, I worked for Burlington Northern for 30 some years. Used to take the train all the time from Wilmer to Minneapolis. That was a few times every week back then. But uh, I work on the track department. I did. Now we're playing, uh, we're out in the middle of South Dakota by Mobridge. We bought a place in Howick because I'm originally from here. My family's all here. So, and I've got an Amtrak pass I'd like to start using. Did you uh, work for Burlington Northern for a long time? Just Burlington Northern. I didn't get in the Great Northern. Okay. So I think I get 50% off or 25, 25 for sure. Now could I My ask wife you? and I. Your Amtrak pass is good any time you're on a Great Northern or Burlington Northern lanes, is right. that right? Yes. Okay. And then I think there's a discount on others a okay. little bit. I want to find out eventually. Okay. A lot of, a lot of places I like to go. Thank you. My name is Dick Dillon. I grew up in Minneapolis. And my first experience at Trace was young. My mom didn't have a car. So uh, she would take us kids on a train to uh, Eden Valley from Minneapolis and then we'd get a ride from there out to Place Lake. <laughs> and then my, uh, when I was in college, for three different summers I hopped up for a train in Minneapolis and then went all the, one time all the way to Seattle, uh, what they call a hot shot mail train. And the other two times then I rode and then uh, got off and went to Ashley, Washington to pick fruit. And then I, one time I did get to ride on Amtrak. I went from <coughs> St. Louis, Missouri to Chicago, from Chicago to Minneapolis. Okay, so you've done a little hopping around, haven't you? Not, not very nice, though. The huh? box cars aren't very comfortable. <laughs> Long uh, Back in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay, wonderful. Well, most of you are of the age that you remember most of the uh, train travel in the United States uh, was that every freight company had to have uh, passenger service also. And uh, there was really a, a great uh, disparity in the service that uh, different railroads gave to their passengers. Uh, some who wanted uh, rail passengers uh, gave you fairly decent service, but for a, a mostly a freight company that just hated having to furnish uh, the uh, passenger service. You really got rotten service on those lines. So I remember one time my wife and I, and I think at that time we probably had two children, we drove to Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, we had my wife Eleanor's mother along with us. We drove by car to Omaha and got on the train and uh, was supposed to leave there about 10.30. And uh, finally the train started and uh, went out of the station and all of a sudden it stopped and it backed up and went back into the station. And we did that for about an hour and a half and nobody knew what was going on and uh, there was a problem with the brakes. And of course, you, you know, a train you have to have brakes. Uh, if you lose air, they're not allowed to move. So. Uh, we went back and forth into that yard, and of course nobody told us anything, so we didn't have a clue what was going on. So that first extensive trip, I, I had to talk real hard to get my wife to go along, and of course her mother was so excited about going, she talked Elmer into being a little bit more receptive of that. And uh, we actually had uh, quite, a, quite a good time. My wife kind of disagrees. She uh, uh, never liked she, she has nothing but bad memories about that trip, and uh, she, I, don't, I think that was the last trip she ever took. And I will say this before I start uh, telling you all the wonderful things. You know, not everything is, is perfect. Uh, now, if you uh, would rather go through an airport and let TSA body pat you 
that, that's your prerogative. When you travel by train, you buy your ticket. When the train stops, you get on, and that's there's no security in terms of having body searches and all that stuff. Uh, as I said, it isn't all perfect because you do have lateness on the train. But you know, at our age, if we decide to go somewhere and the train is late, I guess that's really not a big deal. Uh, it's more of an inconvenience for the people along the way that are, are waiting for us or that kind of thing. But you know, nowadays with cell phones and 800 numbers and everything, you can call in ahead of time, find out if the train is on time or if it's late, and go down to your station accordingly, you know. About uh, oh, a month ago, uh, Matt mentioned I, I started my rail pass, which was 30 days of train travel, and off and on. You're allowed uh, 12 segments, so every time during that 30-day period you get off the train, you've used one segment and you can use 12 segments during that 30-day period. Well, I uh, call Al Thompson over at New London. Some of you maybe know him. He's a, uh, an engineer on Amtrak. He runs from St. Cloud to Minot and back to St. Cloud. Has done that for many years. And he uh, is going to retire on my birthday, the 10th of June this year. And he told me the night he comes back in from his last run, He's going to go into his pickup and he's going to get his book of federal regulations yeah. about that thick and he's going to put it on the platform in front of the depot and say, God, he's going to burn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Al picked me up at my house and we uh, headed down to St. Cloud. When I called the uh, last time that evening to see where the train was, when uh, train number seven would get into St. Cloud, it's supposed to leave St. Cloud at 12.40, 20 minutes to 1. When I called in, it was 20 minutes late. Well, that tells you, you you know, they, they can make that up in a hurry. So I went down to St. Cloud and got into the, into the uh, train station, and there were probably 15 people or so in there at that time, and more came, and, and uh, I called in to see now where the train was, and well, now all of a sudden it became an hour and 20 minutes late, and I'm already in that darn depot. Well, everybody else there was doing the same thing, calling in with their cell phones and stuff. And uh, we uh, waited around, an hour and 20 minutes came, and man, uh, no train. Well, it turned out it was an hour 40 minutes late. So we thought, well, it was more than that. When I finally got on that train in the morning, half the people that had been in the depot left. They wanted to get some sleep. Evidently, and they knew they could get you know their ticket taken care of. We finally pulled out of St. Cloud at five minutes after eight in the morning. Oh. <laughs> and so I tell you, that kind of thing does happen. Now the reason it happened, they uh, pulled into the Minneapolis St. Paul station and they had a brake problem, and uh, they couldn't resolve it. They they thought they could resolve it. They couldn't resolve it. So they. Uh, Ordinarily, I suppose, have other engines, a couple waiting in, in the wings, you know. Well, that particular night, they didn't have an extra engine, so they had to borrow an engine from Burlington Northern Santa Fe. And uh, by the time they got all that rigmarole going, it, uh, it got the same cloud, and we, we pulled out of there at, at uh, five minutes after eight. The gentleman I had met from Mankato was going up to Sandley, North Dakota to... Uh, work, uh, that whole oil field up there, there's so much activity up there. He was an electrician, or is an electrician. He was going to Stanley to work up in that area. And we had, we had become acquainted over about eight hours. I thought I knew the guy as well as uh, <laughs> most other people I know. And so we got in the, in the coach and uh, now of course it's breakfast time. And I told him when I got up and said, uh, let's go to breakfast. Well, he wanted to do something else there for a while first, and I said, I'm going in the dining car. I went in and sat down, and uh, the waitress came and uh, said, what can I get you? And I looked her in the eye and I said, madam, what you can get me is a free Amtrak breakfast. And she looked at me like, uh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> and I said, I've been sitting in that dingy 
uh, depot in St. Cloud since the 11.30 last night. And I said, Amtrak is buying my breakfast. Mm -hmm. And she went over to a little desk and brought a sheet of paper that had a bunch of lines on it. And she said, sign on line one. And so I signed my name and I said, well, hold that sheet right there. I got another guy that's coming in for a free breakfast. So, yeah. so we, no problem. We, we got breakfast and boy, it was a good breakfast. I think she, she probably told the guys downstairs, make sure everything is hot and good for these guys. <laughs> they're, they're complainers. So we got our, our lunch and away we were, or breakfast and away we went and uh, headed out. I was on my way to Portland. I was going to make two or three stops on the way out there. And uh, I've gone on that Empire Builder from Chicago to Portland or Seattle uh, probably uh, 30 or 40 times in my travels. And you know, people say, man, uh, don't you ever get sick of that going through North Dakota? And, and you know, folks, you can travel today and then wait a day or two or three and you know this, uh, having been a you know, railroad person, the scenery can change every day. You get a little bit of snow, for example, an inch of snow on the uh, terrain, and it looks altogether different than it did you know, a few days before. When you go different times of the year, uh, you'll go through North Dakota, and uh, when it starts to melt like it will within the next week or so now, and there are ducks and geese everywhere. I mean, it's just, these potholes are just filled with migrating wa uh, waterfall that are going up into the Arctic Circle for a lot of them, you know. It's it just, I never get sick of going on the train. I'm going to just give you a little bit of an example of what I did one trip. I happened to find this a couple days ago. I. Uh, did a, a chronology of my uh, trip, and I, I, I'll uh, have to go back in some of the uh, different entries here to know what year this was. But I, this one started out at 9.55 in the morning. Now I'm sitting in the, dine, not in the dining car, in the cafe car, in the observation car, and I'm writing down every mile or so that I'm going down the tracks. And here I wrote Hilly areas between Stanley and Williston. Well, that tells you where we were. Patches of snow only on the north slope. So that tells you it was fairly much in the spring because uh, the snow was pretty much melted except where it had drifted. Very barren, clusters of old farm buildings and farm machinery. No wildlife so far. Two minutes later, passing through a cut could be trouble during heavy snow. 958, oil storage area, refinery on the north side at Tioga, North Dakota, on both sides of the tracks. Water tower on the north, community appears to be prospering better than on a past visit. 1001, oil wells visible to the left are pumping, terrain leveling, hills less rolling, trees almost non-existent. Uh, Wind breaks only. Ghost town on the left. I don't know what town that was, but I'm doing this, you know, down the tracks. Well, I did this pretty much for my my whole trip. And then in one of the trains, I was out uh, on the California Zephyr, and uh, I rode here somewhere that we're passing through a little city. There's an Amoco gas station on the left. Gas price a dollar seven point nine. <laughs> so give me a little bit of an idea. This a few years ago. It I think was in the uh, oh late nineteen hundreds. Uh, and uh, I I I I love to take my watch and uh, uh, figure what how fast we're going. Here at this particular uh, uh, juncture, I was timing our our speed. We were going 79 miles an hour, uh, just east of Haver, and uh, made a little entry. No snow for the last three or 400 miles since Williston. And we got into Haver at uh, 2.11 and out of Haver at uh, 2.56. Beautiful grain fields, both north and south. Bear Paw Mountains on the south-southeast, Highway 2 running 
parallel to the tracks on the south side, heading nearly straight west. So yeah, this this could be kind of fun too. You you know one do that every time you go. But I, uh, I I I love history and I love doing things like that. And it's it's so much fun going back uh, and reading that. Now that's ten or eleven years ago, and it, it it's just really kind of fun to go back and to see what I was you know uh, recording here. So. Well, uh, we have a tape here. I, I, I had that on. I don't know if any of you, some of you saw it, certainly. <coughs> when I finish this afternoon, any of you who would like to stay a little bit, I'll just run that uh, video of Amtrak travel, and you can watch that a little bit. And, but to start out, I, what I'm going to do is some of you, or maybe all of you, came this mm -hmm. afternoon maybe with some questions. And I'm going to ask Matt to take that little pad. If any of you have questions about Amtrak travel, uh, let's uh, ask those and we'll try to answer every one of those. If we can't do it by quarter after two or a little after, I'll stay after school and while you're asking questions, I'll answer those and I'll clean the erasers for you. <laughs> so so uh, let's, start, uh, let's start right over here. Did you bring any questions along or uh, I didn't bring any. Okay. All right. How about you? I was just wondering, um, do they have sleepers on all of the trains or just certain? They, certain they, they do or? not. They do not have sleepers on all of the trains, but on all of the long distance trains they do. So if you were going to take a trip, let's say from <coughs> Chicago to the West Coast or from St. Cloud to the West Coast, you can get a sleeper on that train. It, it'll go. You'll have a sleeper the entire way. There are three different uh, size sleepers. There's a small one, an intermediate size, and a larger sleeper. That's called a family sleeper. And of course, the prices vary accordingly. The uh, smallest two does not have a bathroom in it. In the in the uh, uh, sleeper itself, you have to go down the hall. So it's a common bathroom. But if you get the larger sleeper, which again is going to be more expensive, uh, that one has a shower and stool and everything in it. Yeah. So okay. Yes, Jeannie. When you talk about the sleepers, you say yes. Okay. And I'll say uh, a small sleeper. Are the beds like twin size beds? Are they long enough? Or are they a little bumpy? Or uh, if you're in a sleeper. <clears throat> Starting at that wall and going to there and to here and to here. If you are in a large sleeper, that's about how much room you get, maybe a little less than that. If you're getting a really small sleeper, you're going to have from that corner over to about here. So everything has to be converted. Uh, it'll be converted from a bed to a, to a sofa, and if you had a little table to write on, it would be very small. Uh, it, it's it's small. I'm concerned about the sleeping. What we're, the area we're sleeping on. Well, the area you're going to be sleeping on, you'll have a, you'll have a, a bed you can you can like, make like yourself. A bed, oh no! Oh no! It, it, in, in the smallest, you're going to have like a a, a small bunk bed, not a not a regular size bunk bed. It'll even be a little bit smaller. Yeah. But it's not that small. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that small. I'm talking about length. <laughs> oh, length. You're you're fine. You're oh, fine. Okay. Yeah. okay. You'll, you'll, you'll be That's fine. That's why I was concerned about being comfortable sleeping. No, you'll be fine lengthwise. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think we had some questions about. Good. We're going to write all those down, aren't we? Oh, you got a secretary there. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Doing a rail pass. Rail pass. Okay. That's what I just bought. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll uh, we'll get to that. We're gonna. Take a trip out west, and yep. we want to make different stops. Yep. And we're trying to figure out from the internet how to price when you buy the pass and then buy your tickets for all the different segments. Okay. Well, uh, let's answer that one right away. I bought the rail pass, a 30-day rail pass, 12 segments, for $669, and that would cost you twice that if you're two mm -hmm. of you. Uh, it, it will also vary when you buy the, the, the real pass. If you bought the real pass now, uh, you're, you're probably starting to take, get in the early parts of the, of the busy season. So it might be a little higher, but it's really reasonable. Now I'll tell you, 
uh, you want to get off and on, which I did too. And for, I thought it was a tremendous buy for $669. I didn't get a sleeper because I thought if I'm going from here to Minot, North Dakota, I leave St. Cloud at 1240 in the morning and I'm in Minot, North Dakota already by 9 o'clock in the morning. So it's foolish to get a sleeper. All I did was get a window seat and I got a nice pillow when I got on the train. Uh, of course, I got on much later than I had intended to, but, but uh, ordinarily you'd get on at St. Cloud at 20 minutes to 1, you'd be in Maynard already if that's where you wanted to make a stop at, at about 9 o'clock in the morning. So uh, uh, that's your first segment. And, and then I don't know what your plans are, but I'll tell you what I did. I uh, was out in that area to do a little family research. And so I scheduled to be in Minot three days, three full days and three nights. I got back on on Sunday morning to head further west. But uh, I found that to be really a, a nice way to travel, having that rail pass, because I knew when I got on I could get off and get on and get off. Now every time you try to get on the train, of course, there has to be room on it. So if you were in Minot for three days and you decided you were going to leave on Sunday morning like I did, when I called in, I had to find out, first of all, on Sunday morning, is there room on that train? Well, the Empire Builder, most of the time, uh, there's room. If you call ahead to get your, your rail pass started, uh, you have a certain schedule that you make right away when you make your rail pass. So you may have your segments that you want to make all planned ahead of time. When you get on at St. Cloud, uh, you will have, the tickets will have to be printed for all of those segments. Let's say you went to Minot for three days, the next time you get on, uh, go from Minot to wherever, you'll have the ticket in hand already for that segment. And then if you're there two or three days you want to get back on, you have a ticket reserved for when you get back on the train the next time. So, but if you change it now, then th that those segments can change a little bit too. But uh, let's say that you decided to stay four days instead of three. That's going to goof your, your travel up a little bit. But you can call and say, I would like to uh, extend my stay until Monday. That's not a problem if there's room, and usually there is. The only thing about doing rail passes, you have to make sure that when you stop somewhere, it is an age, uh, uh, depot that has a ticket agent, so you can change your tickets. Oh. If you get off at a, at a non-agent station, for example, let's say you went from here to Stanley, North Dakota. The train stops there, but it is not a depot where you can get tickets. So what they generally will do is they will say, okay, you had earlier a ticket going from Minot to Haver, but you got off at Stanley. So you actually uh, had a reserved seat on the train to go to Haver. We'll let you travel with that expired ticket to Haver, and then there you have to change and get up-to-date tickets, so I see. They make it pretty easy for you. That, <clears throat> that clarifies that. And the other thing we're concerned about is it said you buy the pass, 15-day pass to go to Portland okay. and back yep. with five stops, yep. six, whatever. Yep. But then it says you also need to purchase a ticket. So do you buy tickets on top of the pass price? You'll get the tickets with that. The whole trip is the cost of that pass. Is yep. that what you're telling me? Yep. Mine was $669 for 30 days of travel and 12 segments. And we figured out the ticket price would be $1,800, but the pass is only $600. No, that, the pass, if you were to do some other traveling on the trains, you probably would have to pay extra for those. Oh, we had two, two birds. Oh, you, okay, so you, you bought a sleeper. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's going to be a little different. Yeah, that's so going to be a little different. But that's the pass works the same. You can get back on to the same sleeper. Yeah. Or 
Same yeah, type but, of sleeper. But uh, that uh, might be a little bit different, you know, your, your sleeper arrangements, because uh, you're not getting a full sleeper if you got off, uh, let's say, at Minot or whatever, but I'm not sure how that would be priced. But let me give all of you the phone number, and it's mentioned 50 times in those books. If you look in those books, the 800 number is 1-800-872-7245. And uh, she did not get a book probably, huh? Okay, we'll get you one. We'll, we'll get you one. My sister and I can share one. No, you can have one. If you're not living together, uh, you can both have one. I'm sorry, but I need to, I need to go to an appointment. So. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> The eight one eight hundred eight seven two seven two four five one eight hundred eight seven two seven two four five. It's it's found in there in many many different places, so you'll have no no problem. Uh, but I I think re each each of your situations probably is going to be a little bit different. So. When you decide you're going to travel, the first thing I would tell you is make sure that you do it early. You know, get your get your travel plans made and get your tickets early. Uh, right now, if you were going to travel, I would say most of the tickets for the next 30 days are probably already bought. But let let me just give you an idea. Last evening, I wanted to have the price of some tickets to give you folks for today. So I just made up a hypothetical trip. I said I want to leave St. Cloud on the 17th of April and return on the 24th. The tickets for that round trip, one-way ticket from here to Portland, Oregon on the coach now, that's the, not a sleeper, that's just getting on at St. Cloud and traveling in the coach car to Portland. One hundred and thirty-six dollars. Try to fly out there for that. Try to drive out there for one way. Mm -hmm. One way, one hundred and thirty-six dollars. Now, those two dates, the seventeenth and the twenty-fourth, both of those segments was one hundred and thirty-six dollars. Sometimes when you take a round trip. You could go out to Portland for $136, and your trip back could be $350. But in this particular scenario, $272 for a round trip on the coach from here out there. So this rail pass is from, say, St. Cloud to Seattle. Yes. And you have that would depending on which one you buy. Yep. And if you didn't, if you don't take all of your stops. Can you make them up on the trip back, or? Uh, I don't know that. <laughs> that I don't know. When you put when you put a sleeper in uh, your travels, that really uh, changes things a lot because if you make a trip, for example, for the 17th of April, and you want a sleeper only one way, and you're going to take coach on the way back, you you get a whole mishmash of different price quotations. Uh, let me uh, just give you a, a figure here. A round trip sleeper for th uh, those same dates. Uh, the smallest sleeper, your uh, sleeper out and back, were uh, $369, $369 out, $486 coming back. That's only for the sleeper. And then you add the the uh, 272 to that for those dates. The next largest sleeper, for whatever reason, the trip out to Portland, the sleeper alone, $1,341. Out there, 644 back, plus the $272, the trip, round trip tickets. Mm -hmm. The largest one, now this is kind of an irony, the largest one, a family uh, berth for those dates, $523 going out, $684 coming back, plus $272. Now, if I had made the reservation any time 
Last night, up to the 5th of April, those prices are good. If you uh, call and make any changes, like uh, let's say you want to travel uh, 24th of April and come back the 30th, those prices could be much, much different. So what you need to do when you want to travel, first of all, make sure you do your planning and buy your tickets early. Uh, that's going to make a big difference. Uh, this person I talked to last night said that uh, many of the sleeper cars on Empire Builder are not available from, let's say, right now. I just hit it lucky last night with these dates. But some of those uh, travel dates are all booked all the way into October. Oh, wow. So it uh, makes a big difference when you make your reservations. But uh, they're easy to make. Uh, those of you who are familiar with internet, you can make them online. Uh, I usually lay, make all of my trip itinerary ahead of time and I call on the 800 number and give them my travel plans and they give me everything back. And then what they do is uh, they'll uh, email you your itinerary right back so you can check it and make sure everything is kosher. So, yeah. so are you thinking that different times of the year you get a better fare than you would others? Oh yes. I uh, When you get into the summer, the busy travel, mm -hmm. it all is based on usage. Mm -hmm. If they're busy, they're charging more, and that's like everything else. If there's something on the shelf that there's a big demand for, it's going to cost you more when you buy it. You know. But, uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, if you're going to go someplace, set a budget, set a budget. Uh, let's say that you are going to take some trip this summer, nice trip for a week or something. And uh, $2,500, that's our budget. Well, start calling and finding out what your travel, the train itself, and then if you want to add, you know, sleeping quarters to that and stuff, uh, that's fine. Sometimes, I have found over the, the last few years, uh, I can sleep almost standing up. And so I don't mind getting on the train on the coach, get a window seat, and then you can put your head up against, the, you know, the, the wall and you got a pillow and it, it doesn't take me very long to fall asleep. So, but some people, you know, they need a bed and, and that's, you know, you, you have to make sure that if uh, you have a budget set uh, that your sleepers can be included in that, you know. But, uh, I have just had, I, I, I've had so much fun. My wife ha really has a lot of arthritis, and I don't know maybe if she didn't have arthritis if she would, would travel on the train. But, uh, oh, I, I, like, I like train travel. And, but I'm going to tell you, it, as much fun as it is, there's a lot of stuff when you're on your trip that's just going to turn your stomach. I mean, uh, sometimes the service can really, you know, uh, can get bad, but when I when the service is bad, old Tom is writing all this stuff down. And when I get back to Painesville, I call customer service, and I let them know exactly what went wrong. And they say, "Well, we we apologize. Uh, we're going to make it up to you. How does it sound if we sent you a voucher for a hundred bucks on your next trip?" And then I say, "That sounds just great." I appreciate the hundred dollars, but I'd much rather see Amtrak improve its service. And I went on to explain a couple bad experiences that I had, and I did it in a nice way. Uh, I knew when I called customer service in Washington, I was talking to the choir. <laughs> you know, I said the guy I should be talking to is Mr. Joe. What's his name? The guy in the front page there that wrote the letter, he was talking about a new mission that Amtrak is going to have. I said, what's the new mission? And I said, I'd like to write that guy a letter. Well, here's his address. So he gave me the address. Yeah. But I, uh, I I think by doing that, and there's nothing wrong when you're on the train. If something isn't going wrong, going right, talk to your car attendant and the conductor and say, you know, I've been looking, I've been assigned this seat, I've been looking out of this seat here for 
the last half a day and, it, and it, windows are dirty. When you get the haver, would you uh, be able to have somebody wash the window? And you know, th those things get results. Mm. If you sit there and it's crap to yourself, it's going <laughs> to do no good, you know. So. But uh, for the most part, uh, the service is pretty darn good and it's really fun to be on the train and to see the, the America roll by, you know, it's just wonderful. You meet some pretty interesting people too. Oh, yes. Uh, I, 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 I've got the names, addresses and phone numbers of people that I met 20 years ago. I had a lady tell me one time we traveled from North Dakota to Portland. She and a, and a cousin of hers, I think, and you know, this lady and her cousin, they were wearing printed dresses down about four inches above their ankles, and I, I have a bad habit of stereotyping people. I said, I wonder what bush these two came out of. <laughs> <laughs> well, we traveled all the way out to the west coast of Portland, and we had some very nice conversation. But I, I didn't really get into their private life. You know, we just talked about the weather and the scenery and stuff. Well, when we got to Portland, I never thought I'd ever see those two ladies again. Guess what? Seven days later, we were back on the same oh. train, and we were closer together. They were kind of across from me, and so when we started visiting, one of them said, "You know, maybe we should." Go to the to, to the lounge car. We'd have a little more space, and we could hear each other better. So we went into the lounge car, and the the the, the this one. Well, I, I thought both of them had come out of the bush, but uh, they they had come out of the bush, but they had left the bush a long time ago. And so, what it turns out, this young lady, when she was seven years old. They lived in the very corner, northwest corner of North Dakota. She said, if we knelt down, we could put a hand, two hands in Canada, one in Montana, and one in North Dakota. Well, that told me where they lived. She said, I will admit, I was a gifted child when I was young. I loved learning. And somebody told her parents, you should send that child across into Canada. There is a convent there, retired nuns, who love to teach children. They just, well, she said, I don't think we could do that. We're not Catholic. Well, they says, that doesn't make any difference. Those nuns would love to have you there. Well, guess what? She ended up going to school in Canada until she finished her seventh grade. That group of nuns up there evidently were connected with the St. Joseph Benedictine uh, order. Mm -hmm. And they at that time had eighth grade and then of course high school and college at St. Joe. So she came down here for the eighth grade. She went to high school at St. Ben's and then went, uh, well her parents that summer had moved to Texas and they knew she wanted to be a doctor. And so they got all kinds of material for the University of Texas Medical School. And uh, she went home, which then was, was Texas, to her parents. And uh, they had all of this stuff for the University of Texas. And she said, you know, Mom and Dad, I appreciate your getting me all this stuff, but I really want to go back to Minnesota, and I want to go to the University of Minnesota Medical School. So she did. When she got back here, a couple of her friends told her, you know, if you join the ROTC, Reserve Officers <coughs> Training, you could get all your schooling paid for. And so she did that. And she got out of medical school and she was a, an officer, drawing officers' pay. Well, the way it turns out, the lady that I thought came out of the bush and probably is still living there had had been an army doctor for 32 years. Retired out of the service as a full bird colonel. Any of you who are in the service, a full bird colonel, that lady was getting a nice pension. 32 years. So the, she told me when she got off the, 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 the uh, uh, train at uh, North Dakota, whatever stop it was, 
She said, have you ever come back to Portland? I'm taking my cousin back here, and I'm going to stay a few days, and then I'm going back to, uh, to Portland. If you ever come out there, please call me. We'll go out and have lunch, and I'll buy the lunch. Well, guess what? About a month ago, I took the number, and I called Portland, Oregon, and I thought, I'm going to take her up on that. And I called. The phone number you called has oh, yeah. been disconnected. <laughs> 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 are no longer in use. I waited too long. Uh, she either uh, she was probably seven or eight years older than I am, so there's a good chance she may she could be dead. She could be in a nursing home. She could be living in a different number. Uh, maybe has a cell phone and doesn't want her number listed. Did you ever find out why she was dressed that way? No. I, I didn't. You want to ask the important questions. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but you know, that was just an example of, of someone you meet, uh, you, you don't know who you're meeting. Uh, I have met people on the train, I still have their phone numbers and stuff, and uh, some of the people I met, man, they just, I met an artist one time on the train. She was from one of the... Uh, well, bigger cities, uh, let's say Boston or someplace, and had gone through uh, not only uh, maybe the University of Boston, but had gone to an art school. And while we were sitting there, this lady, uh, well, she was watching the scenery and drawing as we were talking, and I couldn't believe how gifted that woman was. And I asked her, have you, uh, you know, with your ability, have you ever uh, sold any of your paintings commercial? She said, I, I, I sold a lot of them. And it was really good. I didn't bother to ask her how much she charged. <laughs> I thought I couldn't afford it, you know. But just all kinds of wonderful people uh, that I've met. Uh, just great. Uh, and now with cell phones, you know, it's so easy. Uh, I met a lady on the train, actually, she and her husband. Uh, she went to high school in a little tiny school in Montana. Who were the folks that grew up in Montana? This, this lady uh, was living now in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Taxes were getting so high in La Crosse, Wisconsin that they decided to sell their home and they were moving out to Oregon. And uh, she uh, told me where she had gone to school. And it turns out that she was a uh, military brat. Her parents were in the service, or her father was. And so wherever he got stationed, she had to, of course, go along as a family member. And she went to this little high school in Opheim, Montana, right up on the Canadian border. And uh, I was going up there that particular trip because I wanted to go up to a Lefsa factory. Any of you ever eat Lefsa? You're all, you all eat Lefsa, haven't you? There's a little Lefsa factory about a mile or mile and a half south of Opine. And uh, she told me when she went to school, if she remembered right, there were seven kids in her class. Well, let me tell you something. Right now in Opine High School, or the whole school, from uh, grade uh, kindergarten to high school, 12th grade, there are 22 kids in, there, in that school, and they are so proud of that of that school. They just continue to keep it open regardless of what it costs. You know, to, to the taxes this is great. You know, so well. Let's continue here. Questions. I I gave you a long answer. <laughs> Pat, have you got any questions? No? Okay. I just question what um, every time you stop. Let's say you have that pass, and you, you don't want to get off and stay. When the train stops, are you allowed to get out? And stay? You are not. You are not allowed to get off the train unless you uh, get off. For example, if you took the train to the West Coast, you'd be able to get off the first time you're able to get off the train. So if you're a smoker, this will kill you. Uh, the first time you can get off the train would be at Minot, North Dakota. And that's about a 20 or 25 minute service stop. You can get off, stretch, walk up and down the platform, go in and have a, a pop or whatever. You can have that on the train too, of course, but uh, it's about 25 minutes or so that you can, you know. So these stops happen all the way out to Portland? There's one at Minot, North Dakota. The next one then would be Haver, Montana. The next one after that would be Whitefish, Montana. 
And then the next one after that would be Spokane, Washington, which if you got on here at 20 minutes or uh, 20 minutes to one, you would be out in uh, you'd be out in Spokane the following morning at 1:30, and there the train is split into two. The large train going from Washington or from uh, Chicago. When it gets to Spokane, Washington, at that point you have to make, you've, you've already decided, are we going to Seattle or are we going to Portland? They change the train, they split it into two. When the trains take off from there, part of the train goes to Seattle, the other part goes to, goes to Portland. So there are opportunities to get off, they're just limited. At Spokane, you can get off. It's about an hour there mm -hmm. while they're switching those trains and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a restaurant upstairs in the depot. Uh, they have a lady there. Uh, she's uh, Asian. She has really good Asian food. So if you can bypass supper <coughs> on that evening, uh, you can eat up in, in the dining or in the dining room upstairs in the depot. And the food that is not included in your ticket. So no. Anything if you buy ticket? if you buy a sleeper with your ticket, your food is included in the price of the of the travel. Mm -hmm. If you take the coach, you can either buy sandwiches and stuff in the dine, in the uh, coach or the uh, a cafe car, or you can go to the dining car. And the uh, the cafe car is open every evening until eleven o'clock. The dining car would start the breakfast about uh, 6.30, ends about 8.30, then uh, noon, uh, I think 11.30 till about 1 o'clock would be your, your noon lunch, <coughs> and then evening they start at 5.30 and it goes until about 8 o'clock or so. Your last seating is at 7.30. Yeah. Okay, Tom, yes. how, how expensive are the meals? Are they really meals are expensive. They're expensive. Train travel, yeah, they're, they're expensive, but uh, they're, for the most part, Excuse me, they're very good. If you if you have a bad experience like I had a bad experience on my last trip, uh, Amtrak bought me a few meals. So uh, you don't have, you know, if your service isn't good, you tell them about it. I had a sandwich why a fourth grader could have cooked a better <laughs> hamburger than I got, and I let them know it. And uh, it cost Amtrak a few bucks. I gave him the sandwich back. I wouldn't eat it. it I, I, when I eat a sandwich, I expect it to be edible, you know. I, I don't, I'm not a complainer, but their service, their business is service, and that's what they're supposed to give you. And so, yes. Are you assigned seats where you need to stay? Seats where you stay? Most of the time you are not. In other not words, what, what happens when you get on at St. Cloud, they're going to give you a, what they call a seat check. They will assign you to a car. a car. The train going west will be seven, and then the car number will be a double digit. So you might be assigned to 711, 712, 713. The reason they do that, they, they want to put all of the people, for example, that are going to Minot in the same car. Okay. Uh, in case you fall asleep, if they've got 10 people going to Minot, what they do, they put this seat check above your seat when they get to where you're going to get off, they will bend the bottom of the seat check up. And when they are going through the car, anybody who is going to get off at Minot, if you're sleeping, they'll say, uh, Minot in five minutes. Uh, and, and then they'll go to the next one. That's, that's how they keep track of everybody. If you got on at St. Cloud, when the train left Chicago, everybody that's going, let's say, to Denver, or not Denver, uh, a Portland or Seattle would already be assigned to a certain car. Because when they get to Spokane, they, if they had people in s six different cars, they couldn't possibly round everybody up, you know. So they put everybody going to certain destinations in a certain car. So they have less work to make sure everybody gets off at the right, right destination. But in terms of the, the number of the seat exactly, no. Uh, you uh, will get that seat check, which will say Seattle or Portland or wherever you're going. And then when you get on the train, you can, depending on how busy it is, you can usually find a pretty good seat 
and then you stick that seat check up above your your seat and then you are on in that seat for the rest of the trip now if you decide maybe that the window is not situated just real good for the seat you're sitting in and there's another seat that has a better view what you do is take your seat check and you walk down and you stick it up there and then you'll get in that seat but you have to stay in the same car otherwise they'd have to run all over the train fighting you see mm -hmm. but generally speaking you don't get a seat assignment which allows you when you get in if you want to nap you know you can get a pillow they'll give you a pillow and then you can put your head against the, the window you know or the sidewall if you sit on the aisle uh, for a tall person it, it, it's a little difficult you, uh, you you know you you find it pretty hard to, to, to sleep sitting straight up but like I said before I don't have much trouble sleeping but I've seen some people that really have a problem trying to you know get a good rest but most of my trips are only two nights long if I get on at St. Cloud and get to Portland and they're in Portland 36 hours and then I, I rent a car get a hotel for a couple nights and uh, then my next segment would be uh, about two days long again so I always you can get off you have a motel you can stay at or something get a good shower and get a good sleep a good night's sleep so uh, all of those things uh, the more you travel the smarter you get about them and if any of you ever are thinking of a, of a trip somewhere and you want to call me uh, I would be more than happy to try to give you whatever advice I can because I uh, I wasn't born yesterday when it comes to train travel. I <laughs> know a little bit about it. You had you had your your hand up. You mentioned uh, you you rent a car. Uh, the big cities have rental close to the station. They do, and in most cases, I like Enterprise because Enterprise not only are they really reasonable, they're as reasonable as any of them. When you call Enterprise and say, I'm going to be coming in on the train at Haver, uh, that would be probably uh, 8.30 or 8, no, about 6.30 in the evening. Uh, what Enterprise often will do, if it's during the week, they will bring a car over there, give the keys to the station agent. When you get there, you can tell them, I am uh, renting a car with Enterprise. I, do you have the keys for the car out here? And they'll let you know that. Yeah. Enterprise real good. When I came, uh, oh, the last one of my stops, I didn't have a car rented, and Hertz actually came and got me at the train station. So that can be done ahead of time. What, what you try to do, though, find out the phone number of the local agency. For example, if you're going to travel out to, I'm, I'm using Minot and Haver a lot because you go through those. But let's say you're going to Minot. Call the local office of Hertz or Enterprise in Minot or Haver rather than go through the 800 number. You're not going to get it any cheaper going through the 800 number. Most of the time, at least as expensive or even more expensive. But Hertz and Enterprise, most of the, those companies will come right to the station. If you're traveling during the week and the their office is closed at 4 o'clock or 4.30 and your train is getting in at 7 in the evening, they'll bring a car over and put the car in the lot there and give the station agent the key for it. The thing that's really nice about Amtrak travel is that flexibility of stopping, getting a car, and checking out the area. Uh, on my last trip out to Minot, I rented a car from Enterprise for three days and I went out south on 81, I think. No, it wasn't 81, 281, the highway. And I went down to the Garrison Dam in that area and uh, checked out all of those coal mines and stuff down in that area. And uh, boy... The biggest, uh, the biggest crane in the world. Uh, yes, yes. I've uh, been there. The, that uh, gasification plant at Beulah, North Dakota, it was built in the middle of the coal field. They built it right in the coal mine. And I talked to somebody, you can go on a tour there. The last tours end at four o'clock in the afternoon. What time did you go there? I didn't take the tour, but I've driven right out to the, okay. to the cranes and stuff. 
Well, I, I got there about 10 after 4, and I missed the tour that particular day. But well, I'm going to do that. that that's, that's a beautiful uh, side tour. If you take a trip out there, take a car and, and go down there. I asked the lady, I, I noticed these big Euclids, these big turnipoles yeah. going across the highway. They look, I had seen large <clears throat> turnipoles up on the iron range in, in, the, in the iron fields. But you should see the size of these things hauling coal. Mm -hmm. She told me that there is enough coal in that area right around the gasification plant for 400 years of operation. And in the larger area, there's enough coal for a thousand years. That's how much coal is there. It'd be a lot more because they ain't going to let us burn it. Oh, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out yet. <laughs> uh, Warren Buffett owns Burlington Northern Santa Fe, and I think he has a few friends in Washington. So it, it may, it may. Someday we may not be able to burn coal, but uh, it'll be a few years. And. Uh, but at that plant, they'll always be able to use it because they're making natural, they're making gas out of the coal. So I think we'll see that for a long time. And Warren's going to change, huh? gonna change his trains to coal, uh, to uh, natural gas. I'm sure he will. Yeah, yeah he will. I have a question. Yes. It seems like trains, Amtrak's go east and west. Is it hard to go south? Like to Fort Worth. Look in your book. In the very front inside cover is a map of the entire Amtrak system. That will answer your question whether you can go north and south. You can go north and south very nicely on the west coast and the east coast and the west coast. In the, in the uh, mid, middle part of America, we're pretty much east and west. Yeah. 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 Chicago is a big rail hub. Yeah. Yes. Are the seats very comfortable? The seats are comfortable. They're they're nice wide they're seats. Not like a airplane seat. Oh no, uh, your seats uh, in the train I would say are uh, 30 inches wide for sure. Really nice. They, they don't recline. They, they recline. They go back uh, fairly good. Uh, is, that, is it just the aisle seat that doesn't go back? Pardon me. Is it, is it the aisle seat that doesn't go back? No, the aisle seat. Uh, Aisle seat goes back as does the uh, window seat. The only thing, what I said, if you uh, if you get a window seat, you can lay your head against the wall. When you're sitting in the aisle seat, all it does is go back, and you're either got your head sticking out over the aisle, or you got it lying on somebody's shoulder, <laughs> which is okay if it's. <laughs> but you can't be zero window seat. You just gotta be left to the draw. You can't reserve a window seat. You just look at the draw. Oh, I think you could. Uh, you can ask for that. I when you make your reservation, I think you could do that. Otherwise, you kind of miss the whole uh, opportunity, right? Well, you know, if you even if let's say that you were traveling 500 miles, let's say you were going from St. Paul to Chicago, even if you got an aisle seat. You can go to the to the observation car, and you, you got you can spend your whole trip there if you want to. The minute you put your seat check up on top of your seat, if you want to go to the the observation car and spend your whole trip on there, you can do that. If you tried that, that's sounds like a nice. I I've I've done that many times. Yeah, you get a better view, right? They ride through there, going to Glacial Park. Pardon me? When you go through Glacial Park, they get up in the observation. Oh, sure. Yeah. But but that's not to say, when you're in your seat, on what time you, you have there. big windows. Those windows, the entire side of the train oh. is windows. So it's not that you don't see. Not like the airplane window. Oh, no. No, no. Not like an airplane window. You have big, big windows to look out of. And uh, it's... Uh, Oh, yeah, the scenery uh, is wonderful out of the train. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you watch this <coughs> film here, they show you all the beautiful scenery, and it's beautiful. But they don't show you some of the other stuff. There's a lot of junk cars and stuff that are going to be along the railroad tracks, too. But, but my wife says, why do you go on that train and see all that junk along? I say, oh, that's the way America is. There's good and bad. People put that junk there, you know. 
That's how it got there. Mm -hmm. You go through Red Wing, Minnesota, and uh, uh, Wynona, Minnesota. There, it's clean as a whistle from one end of town to the other. I don't know how they got people to, you know, to clean things up like that. But there's very, very little backyard junk in either Red Wing or Wynona. Yeah, that's part of America too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you might you might go past a, a chicken coop with. You know, Ten hens in it, or whatever you know. Or if, yes. Years ago, I know when I was thinking about doing this. At one time, Amdurk had like I think four regions in the United States, and you could buy a 30-day pass, or if you, or you could even maybe buy a 60-day pass to go to three regions or two. two. They, they don't have that anymore. They don't have that. Now anymore. you, if you, if you were going to buy something comparable to that, you would be buying the rail pass. You can buy an 8-day, a 15-day, or a 30-day, and then, of course, your segments that you get to uh, get on and off are reduced with the 8-day. With the I think there's only five segments or something like that. And then you, there's a 15-day and a 30-day. Well, then I guess there is a 45. Maybe the, it's a 15, 30, and 45. But that's the thing that has replaced the old USA America Pass that they had years ago. Another nice trip that I took a few years ago, uh, a friend of mine from Sock Center and I went to uh, Churchill, Manitoba. Somebody said that was a fun trip, so we bought a special pass that's no longer available. But you can buy this thing I'm talking about here, the 30-day American pass, and I'm sure VIA Rail, VIA, that's the passenger service in, in uh, Canada. We went from St. Cloud to Grand Forks, took a bus to Winnipeg, and then took via rail from Winnipeg to Churchill. We left on a Sunday night, got up there Tuesday morning, and I'll tell you something, by the time we got up to Churchill, we knew everybody on that train. And, and there were, there were a, I bet you there were 150 people on there, and everybody knew where everybody came from and stuff. Just wonderful, wonderful trip. We got up to Churchill, we walked to the depot, from the depot to the hotel, and uh, put our bags and stuff in and wanted to look around Churchill a little bit, so we walked down to a mall and uh, spent almost the entire afternoon there and then walked back to the hotel at night. And the next morning we were on a bus tour and somebody asked us if we saw the polar bear that was outside of our hotel the, the night before. And we, we hadn't seen it. Well, he's a good thing you did. <laughs> you know, those, those polar bears are hungry. Boy, they haven't eaten anything for a long time. They call the dumping grounds at Churchill, Manitoba, the Capital. polar bear Hilton. And, uh, they love that dumping ground over there. Boy, oh boy. We went out to the polar bear prison, which is when a polar bear gets into town, like the one got there when we were there, they catch him. I suppose they use a tranquilizer gun. And the next thing the polar bear knows, he's in a, in a prison. And they don't feed him anything for all the time that he's in there. All they give him is water. And we said, why would they do something like that? They said, they want to teach that polar bear a lesson. They don't ever want to re have that polar bear remembering when he was in jail in Churchill. Man, did he have good food. No, sir. <laughs> all, he had, all he had was water. And then, of course, when you know the ice is all gone, they take him out and put him on the shore of uh, Hudson Bay and let him swim out and go after uh, seals, you know. But uh, that's a wonderful trip. I, to be honest with you, I don't even know if that trip is available anywhere. I think it is. But boy, did we have a good time on there. Uh, when we got all done with the tra travel in the United States and Canada, we had made 10,600 miles. Oh, we had a great trip. Wonderful. I have one other question is, uh, if you don't get a sleep, it doesn't sound like it makes sense if you're going to be, you know. I'm going to have to get over here. I was, I was just going to say that, uh, um, since most of the travel, if you're going to get off, this would be 24 hours or maybe 30 or less. Yeah. Is there any place to uh, clean up if you don't have a, um, yeah, like shave? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. He asked the question. You know, if you are 
of traveling only a day or a day and a half or something like that, is there a place where you can freshen up and shave or whatever? Oh, sure. They have uh, bathrooms uh, in every car. Uh, there are probably a room for, I'm saying, 70 people to a car, and there's about five or six bathrooms downstairs, separate bathrooms. And then for the ladies, they have a, uh, a dressing room, which has not only the bathroom, but has more space you can hang your, your garments and stuff there. If you wanted to even change clothes, you know. So you can bring, you can bring like a small duffel bag of... Of, uh, clothes or something. Yes, uh, when, when you get on the train, you're allowed two full suitcases, plus you're allowed a small bag which can be a computer or anything else that's a carry-on onto the train. So at St. Cloud, if you were traveling to Minot, we're using that again, if you get on at St. Cloud, you can have two suitcases. Now, there you can get on the train and you can put your suitcases right down in the luggage compartment down where you get on the train. You can take your computer or a small bag with your toilet articles or something upstairs. Whenever you want to go down and freshen up, brush your teeth, shave or whatever, you take your little uh, bag down and you can take that into the bathroom facility with you. So that's all real good. If you decided, for example, that you were going to travel uh, to Portland or Seattle. Now, what you probably would want to do there is uh, check your baggage. But now, there, if you go to St. Cloud, they don't have any baggage service. You'd have to do that. You'd have to make arrangements to get on the train at Minneapolis-St. Paul if you want to check your baggage. But if it doesn't make any difference to you, you can take your two big luggage pieces and take them right on the train with you. And the small bag up to your up to your seat. So there, if you you can take a lot of stuff along. Yeah, that's not a problem. Where do you put those suitcases? Pardon me. Where do you put the suitcases? Well, on they, the seat or up when up? when you when you get on, uh, there are there's a luggage compartment in there that you can just set them in there. They'll help you with that. They, they're right wow. downstairs. You're going to be upstairs, and your luggage yeah. will be downstairs. Wow. So if you have to get at it, which when I travel someplace, I'm always going into one of my bags downstairs. I just get them out and open them up and take out what I want to. And, okay. But you are allowed yeah, full bags. Yeah. I think they can be 70 pounds apiece. Per person? Huh? Per, per person. person. Yeah. Yeah. Two bags plus your computer or whatever you want to take with you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you take food on? Can you take uh, sandwiches or yeah. uh, snacks If on? you don't want to eat a full meal... Uh, they do allow you to take food on. Uh, to a degree, yeah, you can you can take food on. You can have your sandwiches in okay. your little bag or whatever, okay. and you can even have pop. But you cannot take any liquor or beer on the train. If you're going to have that, you got to buy it downstairs. If they catch anybody with with liquor on the train that wasn't bought in the in the train, you'll be usher, ushered off at the next stop. No. No. And. Smokers, they warn everybody when you get on that train, this is a non-smoking train. If we catch anybody smoking, and you're going through Regal at that time, and Belgrade is the next stop, that's where you're going to be spending your time is at Belgrade. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. No, they're strict about that. Years ago, you know, we tolerated smoking anywhere, and you know how that's gone. And I think today almost uh, the, the smokers even love it more the way it is. But I, I've seen some people, boy, uh, uh, when I got off, oh, maybe six months ago at St. Cloud, a guy wanted to smoke so bad he hadn't had a cigarette since Minot, North Dakota. <laughs> and he wanted to get off at St. Cloud, and the guy told him, if you step off this train, you're not getting back on. You know, we, uh, we have a schedule to keep, and even though they are late a lot, they try to keep it on time. Mm -hmm. But if he'd have stepped off of there, he, he wouldn't have got back on. <laughs> so... Yeah, they're, they're tough. And boy, I'll tell you, some of those guys, when they, they get within 30 miles of Minot, which is a smoking stop, you can get off there. They're already, they already have a cigarette <laughs> second in their mouth already to light. <laughs> Could you yes. talk a little bit about the, the bus trip situation? Because that's kind of a big deal. Oh, sure. In a while. If you, uh, for example, are going somewhere that is not served by Amtrak itself, if you look in your book, 
a lot of the pages, they will show maybe just a little two or three cities. Uh, and let's let's uh, I'll let somebody page through here, and we'll uh, well uh, go to page 89, which will be uh, which will be the Empire Builder. If you'll notice, there are a bunch of little smaller schedules over on page 89. Empire Builders on 88. And Duluth is one of those. Duluth, St. Paul, Minneapolis. It shows you what time those buses run. And when you buy your tickets, uh, you can pay also for those bus routes. And you'll get tickets for those. So do they count on your pass? Oh, that's a good question. I I would doubt it because no, I don't think they would count against your your uh, for the segments you mean. No, I don't think they would because uh, you're independent from the train. You get off and you're going to use bus up to your destination and back to the train again. Uh, our trip back east, we left Madison, Wisconsin, okay. which was the bus to Chicago. Okay, and when we got back to Chicago, we had a bus to Madison. Okay. And our ticket was from Madison round trip and back to Madison. Okay. It included the bu the, the bus. Yeah, I, I would I would guess that's true. I but I, when I don't you know talk about this daily the pass. segments, I don't think that would count as a segment against you because it's really it, it's not a Amtrak bus. It's going to be something that Amtrak contracted with. Could be Greyhound, could be Jefferson Line, something like that. But I would doubt that it would count against your segments. Okay. But you could clarify that, you know, call Amtrak and check that. But I've done that. I've taken the uh, uh, Southwest Chief from Chicago to uh, Los Angeles, I think it was, when uh, I got to Raton, New Mexico. I got off the train there and I took a bus up to Denver to visit my wife's sister. It was about a four-hour bus ride from Raton to Denver. Uh, that's shown on that. If you look uh, on, the, on the Southwest Chief, all those trains are listed in the front. Maybe we could uh, page here. I'll tell you how to find that. It's on page uh, two and three, all of the different trains and what page they are. West Coast, uh, let's see. Uh, where is the Southwest Chief here? Routes in the West, Southwest Chief. Southwest Chief is on page 92. If you find 92, pat that route here. Rattan, can you find it on one of these? Where's Denver? Denver, 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 Colorado. Denver, Colorado. Huh? Oh, okay, so Denver would be here. If you, uh, if you go down, almost straight down, you'll hit a little town of Rattan, uh, Rattan uh, New Mexico. That's that train doesn't go from Raton up to uh, Denver. You'd have to take the train from Raton. So all the all the green lines on this are the bus. Yeah, if there's a key down on the bottom that uh, tells you what all those different yeah. colors mean. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Connecting yeah. services. Yeah. yeah. But you find out, <coughs> find out if they come with the pass. Yeah, you you, you you better you know to to clarify that you probably should call him. Track. I'm not sure exactly sure. We're, we're planning we're going to end up in Bend, Oregon, and so we would have to get there on a bus. Okay, you can you can take the train to Portland, and then the the Coast Starlight goes down south. So maybe you could take that for just a short distance. How far is your destination from that? Okay, okay. Well, what you probably would do is go down to Salem, is it? You take the train to Salem and then you can take the yeah. yep. And they'll just build that all into your fare, I suppose. Yeah. What are the handicapped facilities if a person gets a wheelchair to access anything? Okay, if somebody needs uh, special help, uh, they have at most stations, like at St. Cloud, when you get on there, if you had uh, somebody in a wheelchair, they have, uh, well, when you, when you make your, your reservation, you ask them uh, for special help when you get to St. Cloud. So they'll have this automatic lift 
they bring that over, you drive onto that, it lifts it up and brings it right into your into the train. And then uh, if you have a wheelchair, you are, are are located on the main floor. So the bathrooms would be on the same floor as you, your, your seat or, or reserved area is going to be. If you're able to make steps, uh, you would get to go upstairs. Yeah. Now, they have good railings and everything, so if you have to be downstairs in the area for the handicap, well, it's there and it's there for that use. But if you can make stairs, the railings and everything are really good. It may take you a little longer to get upstairs, but I think it would be much handier for you to be upstairs because your uh, dining car, the cafe car, the lounge car, all of those are on the upper level. You, you just simply walk from car to car to car. Now, if you get a sleeper, the sleeper car, you can also go to the lounge car. So in other words, when you are in your sleeper, if you want to go sit in an observation car, your sleeper has not much of a window. You're you know, kind of peeking out like a, an astronaut out of the space capsule. So you just say, hey, let's go to the dining, the dining car and have breakfast, and then we'll go to the lounge car and spend half the day in the lounge car. You can spend all day in there if you want to. Your ticket that you bought, it, it's for the whole the whole train. So, but when you have the sleeper and they make up the berth in the morning, then you're expected to just stay in there. Oh no, no, you I, I, except you can you can get out of there anytime you want to. You yeah, go you into the regular car and yeah. sit then. Yeah. Okay. No, no, you can't. You oh. can't go into the coach cars. The coach cars are reserved seats for the people who buy a coach. Oh. You can go from your sleeper into the observation car and then downstairs in the observation yeah. car is a restaurant where you can buy sandwiches. And Otherwise you just sit in your sleeper car, huh? Yes, you do. Oh, I don't like that. Well, <laughs> you know, if, if somebody wanted, is, is a person who likes to read and, and doesn't yeah. care to be in the, in the, in the uh, yeah, observation you car, yeah. you, know, you can stay in there if you want to. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go to the, the observation car and you play cards, you bring your cribbage board and play cards or something in there. Uh, you know. One of the things my brother-in-law found to be really odd, we were getting into some of the prettiest scenery in the world. And when you looked around, anybody from about nine years old to 17 were on <laughs> tablets, iPhones, iPads. My brother-in-law said, why aren't they looking at the scenery? Clarence, that's, we're in a different generation. They were getting more fun out of looking on the tablet or iPad or whatever, you know. Yeah. But that's Maybe their business. Maybe they'll grow into it. Huh? Maybe they'll grow into yeah, it. Yeah, you'd, you'd hope so. Should we wrap up and then oh, they we can, can. save? Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, I'll stay here just as long as... Uh, what do you think was the prettiest one you've been on? I had a fr friend in the middle 80s. He wrote articles for magazines to train the Amtrak and different trains, um, railroads would hire him to write articles. Mm -hmm. He'd ridden over 200 passenger trains, like New Orleans to Portland and all over. He always said the Empire Builder through Glacial Park was the most beautiful. Oh, yeah. The Empire Builder not only is a beautiful route, it used to be the best service. Oh, yeah. They claim when you when you go east of Chicago, not not only is there the scenery not as good, mm -hmm. the service because people just that mentality is almost like people have been kicked around, so they want to kick everybody else around. Right. I mean, it's, it, that's the the mentality out there. I had an uncle that lived in Chicago. Wow, when he came out here, I thought he was the meanest guy in the world. And my aunt used to say, you know, that's out in that area of Chicago, that's the way you have to live, or they, everybody would walk right over the top of you. Yeah. I, I'll never forget one time, my, my, uh, we went down to Illinois, and we were helping my uncle and aunt put the storm windows and stuff on. And so we were outside washing windows and stuff, and the poor devil that came to read the gas meter, my uncle jumped on him, 
why they were raising the gas rates again. That guy didn't have a clue why they were doing it, but you know, but he just jumped on anybody he could. But that's kind of the, the way it is. Uh, you're 100% yeah. you're right. The he, Empire he Builder, the, service to the, us the California better. Zephyr, once it leaves Chicago and goes, goes out through Denver and that's Salt beautiful. Lake City, beautiful, beautiful. I would say all around scenery, the California Zephyr from Chicago to Sacramento, California, and then beyond that down to, to uh, Los Angeles. It, it's really pretty. How many of you have heard, you've read the, the history of the Donner family, that yeah. the Donner, the Donner uh, family yeah. that uh, had uh, oh, yeah. nearly uh, two-thirds of their, their family wiped out? They tried to take a better, faster route from just wherever they were to <coughs> the West Coast. Somebody said, I can get you there faster. Well, he, he maybe could have, but they left a day too late when mm -hmm. they got to the certain, the Donner Pass is named after that. Aww. They got to that place, they couldn't get any further. And about two-thirds of that family that left, uh, I think they left Kansas, went to, from Kansas out there, they died uh, in that. So the Donner Pass is just, you go through the Donner Pass, Donner Lake is is in that area, you go on that uh, route uh, on the California Zephyr. And then as you're going west further, you're traveling alongside of the uh, Cal Colorado River for 238 miles. It's just beautiful, beautiful area. When you get to, to uh, Reno, from Reno to Sacramento is probably, oh, I don't know, um, I would say four, four hours, something like that. Uh, the the elevation of the train goes down just it's just almost if I think if they'd let the brakes off it <laughs> it'd go all the way to Sacramento yeah. it's just a gorgeous gorgeous area when you leave Sacramento heading eastbound I think in 40 minutes you've already gone up 6,000 feet or something like that mm -hmm. that train just really works its way up but all forest and just really pretty just really really, really pretty well, uh, if any of you have a question that we didn't answer, please uh, stay and I'll try to answer your questions. We'll put back our little tape here. And by the way, there are all kinds of these tapes available through the Great River Library. So you can get them through there. This is the one I had on here is the uh, uh, volume one, uh, regular Amtrak travel, and they have the, another volume too. So, but. Uh, is that Amtrak pass you're talking about? It's good for almost all, any of these, all along. Oh, you can go anywhere in the United States if you can. If you can travel in 30 days, yeah. get get off the train. Uh, what did I say? 12 times. Yeah. Yeah. 12 yeah. times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any time you get off the train, it's a segment. You can have both yeah, of them. I understand. If you uh, if you travel on the 30 day pass, you have uh, 30 days to finish your travel. If you were coming back into St. Cloud, it has to be the morning of that 30th day. Yep. I see. Well, let's hear it for Tom. You, want to do. Huh? you could come back sooner if you want. Oh, sure. I, in fact, I did that. On my 30-day trip, I went out, came home, gave my wife about three kisses, and got back on the train and left <laughs> again. So, so you could make your, yeah, your start wanting to stop. But keep in mind, if you are changing your travel plans, Tickets can only be issued where there is a station attendant. Saint how Cloud, do you know where that is? St. Cloud no longer has a station attendant. Probably to be in here. They're open an hour before, an hour after the train comes in or goes Are they in this book where the agents are? Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Well, study that book, and boy, there's a lot of information in there. I think you'll enjoy that. And uh, uh, if you're ever taking an Amtrak trip, don't make the mistake of wearing a flower dress with four inches. <laughs> 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 well, thank you.